He always dates everything when he does the drawing and, and whatever. Sometimes he won't publish it until much later, but the original uh, date would be there. Uh, that, that's uh, a skeet in his memory again with the details uh, of it. Your part of the world, more or less, uh, there. Um, again, um, another one of the photographs of him that, that survives, looking quite happy with himself. Uh, of course, in those days, no man went anywhere without a hat. Uh -huh. um, if you were a countryman, you went with a cap. Um, uh, being a gentleman that he was, he, he'd be wearing his hat. Again, the uh, excellent writing, very readable, no problem for those of us who are trying to read things today. And um, great kind of no waste of paper or anything else, very close together. Um, uh, great, great um, details uh, uh, on uh, everything. Um, sometimes in these publications you get uh, an insight into his um, uh, thinking and what, what he talks about uh, there. When he, he, this is his study of the ancient churches in Limerick. Uh, he says, uh, you know, he's being modest, my readers have given us and their criticism by publishing corrections for my mistakes, which most probably may have proved to exist in so very wide and complex a subject. The survey is the work of a pioneer and does not pretend to be exhaustive and a final monograph. And he was very much a pioneer in um, uh, doing all of that. Again, he goes on about the importance of correcting mistakes. Irish archaeology must weed out mistakes, mm -hmm. try it after more critical and widening views. And um, the way he says that we've had to correct the work of our predecessors, we hope our own mistakes may be speedily found out and eliminated from the fields of Irish archaeology. Again, he was actually quite unusual in that, um, probably quite unusual amongst historians and scholars to this day who don't like admitting or refuse to admit their mistakes. Uh, he is uh, uh, very, very um, uh, 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 strong about that. Um, again, he's talking about uh, what he's doing, that um, what you need are proper surveys and lists which remains. First need of archaeology uh, is to um, document what's there before, in particular, you start um, coming up with um, interpretations and uh, theories. Again, he's talking here about um, castles in Limerick and how frequent they are. Then he says, tradition in Limerick seems less reliable than in Clare, but local workers may be able to correct this. A more critical inquiry is necessary in collecting legends now that history is more accessible. Still, the influx of English families absolutely uninterested in the past story of their lands must have sorely affected mm -hmm. tradition in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, he's, he's quite um, critical of his own class for that sort of um, uh, approach and activity. Uh, and uh, I think I have something else later on where he talks about um, uh, uh, place names and his approach to that. Again, just to the occasional insight that you get into how tiring and exhausting um, the kind of work he was doing involved. After a long day spent in climbing over rocks and dangerous walls with ever-growing weariness, pain and lameness, one reaches a fort far from the road, the dull light or the moss and bush bushes conceal steps or even a closed or half-buried gateway. And, you know, so many of these sites were over difficult terrain, uh, difficult to access and whatever. Um, and um, when you see the amount of um, field work that he did, uh, it is uh, extraordinary. Uh, I said um, uh, earlier on that um, he published no book. He did produce uh, a, a short pamphlet um, on uh, Brian Baru. Um, uh, but 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 it is it is quite quite a short. He calls him the hero of of um, Tarf. It was published in 1940. Again, it was a reprint really of articles that he had written 
in uh, a magazine called the Irish uh, uh, Monthly. Again, he um, gives us an insight into his thinking and his, what you call his philosophy, I suppose. Um, he was quite reluctant to often draw conclusions, and in particular, uh, what you might call premature conclusions. So he says there, I have no intention to originate theories. Researches in Irish ethnology, lists of the actual distributional forts, records of the remnants and other objects found in them, must first be made before you start coming up with theories. And again, he was, um, in a way, quite different from the kind of antiquarians who had come before him, who always wanted some kind of um, fancy, often outlandish theory about you know what wrong towers were or what uh, things were for uh, forts. And uh, he's saying, no, no, you must do the groundwork, do the spade work. Once you've done that and have some evidence to go on, then you can start coming with, with a theory. Um, meanwhile, he often quotes from scripture as well. To be a seeker is to be of the best sect next to being a finder. And though theories die, facts live and remain current coin. Mm. Um, where he did um, support his own class, if you like, and where he was critical of um, country people and farmers, um, was in the way um, he felt so many of the forts and other antiquities were um, um, not being preserved. And he has a go uh, at his people of Clare. So little does the professed patriotism of the men of Clare bear fruit in the near uh, or preservation of their country's past. Since I began my work on the county, the ruin of its remains is alarming. So he was very worried at the destruction of monuments like the forts. And he was particularly worried about the uh, land acts. Um, he felt that um, the old landlords had uh, an, uh, an appreciation for preserving castles or forts and whatever. And he worried now that the farmers were coming to own their lands. And from what he had seen of their approach, he felt that um, they wouldn't have the same uh, sense of duty to uh, protect them. Um, again, he was. He used the work, of course, of the Ordnance Survey, particularly John O'Donovan. Um, some people had criticised Westrop initially and saying, what are you going around doing all this surveying for? Didn't John O'Donovan do that with the Ordnance Survey in the 1840s? And he pointed out, first of all, that um, the Ordnance Survey was um, not that detailed and often uh, inaccurate. Uh, and he felt that a lot of the material in the Ordnance Survey letters um, um, was uh, unreliable. And um, he, he's quite critical uh, of uh, the Ordnance Survey from that uh, uh, point of view. Um, again, he's criti criticizing O'Donovan there, uh, but they didn't use the kind of sources that he was using. The Black Book, which is a great source for Limerick history, the surveys and state records, um, and then he goes on to criticise the use of place names. Again, that um, mis misinterpreting place names, uh, deserting the near crew, and that they were coming up with a, a different name uh, for somewhere near and, and whatever. So he's quite critical uh, of that. Um, in particular, he has strong views that you can pick out. I mean, he, he doesn't at anywhere sit down and say, this is what I think, this is what I believe. But when you go through his writings and his articles, in different places you can get um, um, uh, his um, thinking and, and, and his uh, approach on it. Place names, he felt, interestingly, um, the best source for people on place names were people who were either illiterate or certainly uneducated. And his, his view there was that um, country people with no education or whatever, that they had preserved 
the folk tradition mm. and the beliefs that were there. Uh, whereas if uh, people who had been educated, they might have read the Ordnance Survey, they would see what John O'Donovan had said, and then they, they would decide that that was the correct uh, thing to actually uh, say. And, you know, in many ways, a very, a very sound approach mm. that he, he was getting back through the generations. You know, somebody would say to him, oh, I remember my grandfather said that that was always called that or whatever. Mm. So he's quite, he's quite strong uh, uh, on that. Sorry, do you think he had a grasp of the Irish language? He doesn't seem to have had. He doesn't seem to have had. Uh, and, and it never appears uh, um, in his publication, other than on things like saints' names and things like that. But um, even then, the sources he's using... Uh, um, if there are manuscript sources, are Latin uh, rather than Irish. So he, he doesn't appear to have to have that. Um, the other, um, but, but, but again, if he got information about a place name um, from somebody with the Irish, he would quote that, that it had come from something. But, but it, it would be just quoting. Somebody had told him that rather than that um, he was able to decipher you know, an Irish name himself. Um, again, he was opposed by and large to the restoration of monuments. Um, and I suppose any of you who would go to Ugrange today might see, see the wisdom of his approach. Um, again, his idea was, uh, and what often happened in his time was inaccurate uh, restorations, you know, in places like Dun Angus and the Iron Islands, whatever. People who had an idea of what it was. Uh, it was a fort, so therefore it, it had to be military and whatever. And sometimes when they were restoring them, they were putting in what they liked as military features and whatever. So he was saying, okay, stabilize something, make sure that it doesn't uh, deteriorate and whatever, but only do that. Uh, don't, don't do uh, anything um, beyond that in terms of restoration. Um, he certainly approved of uh, excavation, uh, that it, it was uh, an important tool, and he lobbied at various times for funds for excavation, and he was quite critical of the um, Dublin English administration for not giving sufficient funds for excavation and indeed for uh, scholarship uh, generally. But he never himself took part in any excavation. Um, which is interesting. Um, he may have felt he had no particular competence to excavate, and he may have, you know, that there are various stories in the late 19th century of people going out to excavate and using dynamite and mm -hmm. things like that. So um, uh, he may not, uh, would not have wanted to any part of that. Plus, I suppose he was so busy doing what he was doing, which was surveying and all the rest of it. But at the same time, you, you would think he'd have been curious and might have mm. got involved. The other thing, of course, is there were few enough excavations really going on in, in that period anyway. And for whatever reason, he he's approves of it, but he doesn't himself uh, get involved. Another di dimension of uh, Westrock is his photographs. He uh, acquired a camera as a young man. Um, you know, he, he did come from a privileged background, so he was able to afford everything for drawing and um, uh, cameras and whatever. And there are even accounts, I talked about it, his diary as a teenager. There are one or two references in the diary that he was going out for the day uh, doing some field work and whatever. And the butler prepared and brought his lunch for him. So <laughs> that kind of background there. But um, he... Um, Constantly took photographs. Again, they are of major value to us today. Th these ones I picked out are his photographs of the aftermath of the 1916 mm. Rising in Dublin. Oh, that sure. He went out there the following week and took all these photographs. Mm. Yeah. And they popped up on TV a few times. Many mm. people have been, have, have been uh, using them. Mm. So the GPO, mm. this is the, um, where ITG the ITGWU uh, face. And whatever. This is himself as um, uh, an older man. <coughs> Not that he lived to be that old. I mean, he died at the age of 62. Um, it's not clear, but it seems to be from some form of kidney disease 
nephritis or something like that. And he was in failing health for the uh, few years um, uh, before, before he actually uh, died. Um, when the mother dies in 1891, he, we find him living in number 77 Leeson Street, Lower Leeson Street, um, which appears to have been um, some kind of, of, sort of lodging house, I suppose, if you like. <coughs> it's run by a woman called Bertha Hart, who um, is quite a young-ish woman. Um, uh, in her thirties, uh, originally from Killarney, and she certainly <coughs> owns the house. Um, within a couple of years, his nephew, or step nephew, if you like, the, the son of his stepbrother, um, Hugh uh, Westrop, he um, goes to study in Trinity College, and he also stays in the house. Um, and <coughs> within a year or two, he actually marries Bertha Hart, who's about eight years older than him. Um, you know, she, she's almost <coughs> nearer in age to the uncle than she is, is, is to him. Um, but anyway, uh, they do, and he lives with them. And then uh, around 1902, they all move out to um, um, Sandy Mount, and uh, they live there. So effectively, from um, the time he uh, moves to Leeson Street, the rest of his life he lives with the nephew and his wife and their two children uh, eventually. And um, when Westrop dies, uh, they are his main heirs. So um, he seems to have been this kind of, of uh, uh, beloved uncle kind of figure and insofar as I say he never married so insofar as he has a home life and whatever it is um, uh, with the nephew and his wife and children. Um, there's some evidence that he, he got on well with children. The McNamara's for example, Dr. McNamara's daughter um, later gave an interview saying that whenever he came to stay uh, um, uh, with them you know, as children, that they always loved to have him coming, and, and that, that, that he was, he was um, uh, great fun uh, to have uh, in, in the house. Um, he came from, uh, obviously, a unionist background, landlord background, doesn't ever get overtly political, probably kind of liberal, um, possibly, certainly accepting of home rule. Uh, at one stage, because somebody describes the West Drops as West Britons, and he doesn't like this at all, the West Drops were not West Britons, as if they were Welsh or some kin to Lloyd George, <laughs> which of course shows, shows his politics as well. Yes. One way. They were either Norse, to judge from their thick skulls, <laughs> <laughs> or more Irish than the McNamara's of in a state. <laughs> so there. Um, other places he talks about that he comes from, he's, he's one of the countrymen of Shakespeare and Milton, which again would, would show the kind of background. Uh, he was a Freemason uh, all his life. He's initiated into um, Lodge 143 in Dublin in June of 1892. And he does appear to have been an active Freemason because he becomes he, get, he has offices within it, a washable master in 1904 and again in 1917. This is a fairly, um, I want to say, low grade within the Freemasons. He, he never rose you know, to higher positions within in the Freemasons, so presumably he was on, only privy to some of their minor secrets or whatever. Again, it would, it would have been very usual for somebody of his religion and background uh, to be involved with the Freemasons, um, you know, for charitable kind of activities. Um, uh, mainly. Uh, his last will and testament is interesting. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it shows he had quite uh, substantial assets, um, and he had eventually, when they moved to Sandy Mount, the um, they seemed to be renting the house, but eventually he bought it and uh, then uh, left it to the niece and whatever. 
Uh, I direct that my funeral should be strictly private and conducted in the most inexpensive manner, and I shall be buried in the earth after a doctor shall examine my body and pronounce life to be extinct. <laughs> so he, um, there's a word for fear of being buried alive. It's taphonomy or something. And uh, taphonomy, I think. Um, looks like he might have had that. Um, or a sense of humour. Would you have a sense of humour in your will? <laughs> Maybe you would. Yeah. Maybe you did. Maybe. Uh, well, uh, you've been trying to get a sense of his personality yourself too. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just I don't throwing know. it out there. No yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. It's curious anyway. Um, he said then, I wish only a plain tombstone or a Celtic cross with simple mm. inscription. I wish to be buried near my dear mother at Kilpeacon Church. Yeah. Uh, this is Kilpeacon Church, and that, that is the family vault. Mm. Um, that was the nearest Church of Ireland church, Twenty Flynn. And it, it's where his father was buried. There's a stained glass window in the church to the father. And um, the mother, um, one assumes, almost certainly, uh, that she's buried in the tomb. Now, when he says then he wants to be nearer, it suggests that he doesn't want to go into the tomb, mm. but that, that he wants a grave in the ground uh, nearby. And um, that the inscription on the, on the uh, tomb uh, is to just his father. There's no mention of the mother or uh, him. And the Shannon uh, Historical and Archaeological Society uh, last year, Father Centenary, uh, they erected a plaque uh, on, on the um, uh, tomb there uh, in memory of Westra. Uh, a very nice plaque, and uh, you know, they describe him very nicely. Antiquarian, artist, and photographer, which does you know, um, encapsulate uh, some of the central features of his life that I, I've been trying to convey to you, uh, who devoted his life to recording uh, Ireland's uh, 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 antiquities. Now, um, the assumption was um, that um, he was buried uh, with his mother, and even though uh, there's no headstone in Kilpeacon, um, so the sort of feeling that most of us had was that um, he despite wanting to be in the ground, mm. that they actually put him into the um, uh, tomb uh, with, with, with his mother. But, um, can I blow my own trumpet here? <laughs> I discovered um, <laughs> recently, or relatively recently, well, the end of last year, around the time of the centenary, that in fact, he's buried here in Mount Jerome Cemetery in Dublin. Oh. And oh. He, he did get his Celtic cross, uh, Thomas Johnson, Thomas Johnson Westrop. Again, uh, they have him down MA and CE, civil engineer, antiquary, and uh, he, he's born in Etiflin, County Limerick, and uh, died in Sandy Mountain, Dublin, 9th of April 1922. And there's a nice inscription, whether he chose it or, or, or somebody. Um, his nephew or relative, um, the night cometh when uh, no, man man can work. no man can work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, did you, how did you find out? Painful, painstaking research. <laughs> 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 it's very very nice you. Um, I was trying to find out more about Bertha Hart, because she was fascinating me yeah. in some ways as well. And when I was searching for Bertha Hart, it turned out she was buried in Mount Jerome. And I scratched my head and said, well, he lived with them all yeah, his life yeah, yeah. and then whatever. And lo and behold, uh, and uh, again, um, the uh, Bertha, Bertha Westrop, Bertha Hart, she's there and uh, uh, her, 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 her husband. Um, again, just to finish up, I was talking about uh, his willingness to accept criticism and modify his views and errors. 
uh, you recall, about 1897. I was advised by two prominent older members in that period not to publish corrections to my papers or to modify my theories. It entirely undermines your reputation to do so, and no one will know you were wrong. <laughs> that, that would have been uh, something uh, of the day. Um, to finish up, and obviously I'd be delighted for questions or for the discussion or, or whatever about it, um, but you know, finish up just a quotation for uh, this man who privileged okay and whatever, but who really uh, devoted his life um, in the most extraordinary, committed, and determined uh, uh, manner. So he says in, you know, he's felt healing at this stage. So we may hope that in the future men train to stern ourselves that price that we, without seeking for any great fame, less for any material reward, may work beside us in the field of Irish archaeology till we fail and then take on the torch from our hands and carry it on into the darkness further than we uh, ever hoped to do. Um, all generations of historians, archaeologists, folklorists and whatever from that time have indeed been indebted to him and have, uh, you know, all of them uh, in one way or another uh, uh, fulfilled this kind of wish that he has. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I'm always trying to stop myself going on too long, but anyway. I'm sure the illustration of him in a dress, uh, when he was uh, at such an age, but I didn't know it was in the, what they call them, the upper classes. Mm. But it was quite common among the less well off. Yes. If you could buy these in, in, in dresses, it was yes. said to, to confuse the fairies. Yes. Yes. That's right. As well, yeah, that's yeah. As well uh, another thing, uh, being a, a farmer, and I was a farmer in my life, uh, I'm not in the best issue of these days, but mm. anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of uh, monuments that ha ha were left were, were again due to the fairies because yeah. they were afraid to touch yeah. them. Yeah. 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 As, as soon as we stop believing in fairies as well as God um, in Ireland, um, it had a. Um, I suppose the worst destruction really was in the 60s and 70s when, you know, the EU came in and yeah. farmers were expanding and, you know, the, the well, still, to this I think they have a bit uh, more, well, with reps and all these things now, it pays them not to be knocking them for some things, well, doesn't it? Me and the farmers were, and myself, as I said, mm. but uh, my father warned me that the mom there don't touch that. Don't touch it, yeah. And I didn't touch it, but and my, I told my son the same thing, leave it. The rest of your farm. Will they listen to you? Yeah. I think you will. That's good. Yeah. It has a bit of a yeah. No, I, I think I think younger farmers really, um, you know, uh, they're, they're happy enough just to knock ditches and yeah. do all the other things. Uh, I think they're more to inclined leave, to they're leave, they're to leave things now. And as I say, with the rep scheme and whatever, um, you know, there's more awareness of the environment and all the rest. Of it. So, I'm, I'm, so I think the worst yeah. is over in in terms of. Lots of mm. I'm, I'm wondering too, yeah. from my mother's home area of Ballanderi in Kimbara, mm -hmm. that uh, my impression that I formed, a bit like what you're saying, the, the sense of what people locally would say about these places, mm -hmm. like the fairies, Nora, that the ancient old ones, going back maybe to the 16th century, the old forts, and that's the old ring forts, and that, maybe because that's like a mysterious past, and maybe the more recent things that are associated more with the Normans and medieval. Mm -hmm. Maybe they, they were a bit more open to knocking them because there wasn't the mystery yes. and the power of ancient mm. Ireland about yeah. them. I wonder if that a factor. Yeah. So there isn't a no, reverence for those so much. Yeah. Yeah. Getting them with a handy stone off that, mm. isn't it got fine stone in it too, kind of mm. thing. Yeah. And rob some, some yeah. castle yoke there on their land, you know, some building yeah. on their land. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Liam, uh, just a couple of things. One is that there's, there'll be a drop of tea afterwards and there's a relation box outside if anyone liked it for the Cup of Bob Expo, mm -hmm. but uh, I think we're extremely lucky to have had you tonight. It's a rare thing to have a talk about West Trump, so thanks very much indeed. And one question, that is, Nick, you might help me with this question. It's about, you said to me once that he stayed West Trump in a house in Oct Dara, was it? Oct Dara, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, as you drive down, you go down a long hill, I don't know if you know it, into Oct Dara, mm -hmm. and the old ruined church. Yes, the okay. Era had right. There's a turn left and there's an old house in there. And he oh. Apparently, when he was doing that area, he stayed in that house. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I forgot 
But I can't think of the name of the people. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. Dara. Oh, Dara. Um, Ballon the Magic. Yeah, because it sounds familiar. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, he may have had... No, of course, yeah. let's say he stayed with the sisters, uh, Mrs. Stempool in, in um, Eden Vale, and, and Miss Mahan and Tolla as well, when he would have been doing uh, other parts. But, and, of course, with Dr. McNair. He, he also, there was... Um, a Dr. Stackpole, uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Willie well, Stackpole, Dr. Willie Stackpole, Mr. Barney, was he could be, 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 he an epiphany right. yeah. which you have been about. And that's yeah. what put him on okay. put him on the, 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 yeah. the journey yeah. Yeah. that he continued yeah. to his to the end. Yeah. Yeah. But Thanks. it's amazing Thanks how that, you know. how little is spoken mm. in this in this area mm. about the father of Bonnard mm. Right. Yeah. Nobody wants to know about Westrop. Mm. And he's huge yeah. in American academia. Mm. But I never hear a word about him here. Never. Yeah. We had his photo we had his first Mm -hmm. uh, camera right. up in the Bowling Centre mm -hmm. and we had some originals yeah. of his sketches yeah. and drawings yeah. because his engineering yeah. training yeah. helped him very much to be, yeah. as you mm -hmm. pointed out there on his mm -hmm. drawings, to be exact and measured. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was trained in drawings. Yeah. Are you the only place that has anywhere named after him even? No place. Yeah. Yeah. It's partly something to do with that kind of yeah. English yeah. landlord yeah. background yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. The new free state yeah. kind of yeah. 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 people's son. Yeah. It's no yeah. like biography yeah. written yeah. of him. No documentary film, you know. It's mm. 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 almost cancelled, like, you know. Yeah. Mm. But in, in terms of Octara, he said something really fascinating. There's a Killeen or unbaptized baby's burial ground in Octara, just beside where he's staying. And he said only children less than seven years old, unbaptized, were buried in it. And that's remarkable that if that is true, what he said, it is what I've ever come across the distinction of children under seven. Uh, mm. Age of reason or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 In that same area, when you mentioned his, 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 his recognition of the, the value of the local law, mm. local names for places, mm -hmm. in that same area, a place I've fished for years. It's near Ballinlacken on the way to Fenor. And I've always known it as Ballyreen on the map. And I think that was it in Tim, Ro on Tim Robertson's and the Ballyreen. 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 It's Bally Ryan. And it's puzzled me and intrigued me since years. Like, what's going on there? Ryan, Ryan and Reen. Yeah. Reen would be the Irish. Yeah, yeah. but would Reen be Reen. Ryan? Yeah, or Reen. Oh, right. Reen. 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 I grew up in Saturn, I didn't realise. Well, that would explain it. Reen's point. But well, it's nice in, in Irish. Yeah. 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 Okay, it's yeah. simple yeah. as that. Yeah. Thanks for enlightening me. Yeah. You, you were saying that the, mo the mother was an amateur artist. Is there any writing or sketches left, by, left behind by her? Uh, I think um, George Stackpole, the um, um, antique dealer in, in Limerick, um, he has a lot of, um, uh, of Westrop stuff. And I, I think he has some sketches uh, by her. But uh, I mean, it, it was very much the activity of um, Victorian women. Of a, a yeah. Victorian women. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, to do that. Um, but um, George has a lot of material. Um, and um, e even though he's he's um, great 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 nephew or something of of. Um, Mrs. Stackpole in Edenville. Um, he actually acquired most of it. Um, after our Westrop died, um, the um, two um, uh, nephews, grand nephews, we'll, we'll say the nephew that he lived with, um, they had two sons and, and whatever. And one of them went to Australia, another one um, was, was um, a doctor, I think, in Dublin. And it went again to the next generation who um, had some kind of a big, damp house in County Wicklow and who were 
um, currently a bit odd and whatever. Mm -hmm. So an awful lot of the personal material oh. that was there and finished up in that house. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was, was damaged, but it came up for auction or George heard about it and mm -hmm. he actually bought it. Mm -hmm. So we'll say the, the actual diary that I talked about, um, George actually has that. Mm -hmm. has actually saved um, um, uh, that. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I was thinking as well about that interesting, that kind of, the signature. Did you say that she grew up in, in India? Which well, was born she there. Was I think born, she had come okay. back to England, oh, okay. you know, go to school. Something and whatever, that yeah. maybe little yeah. thing well, was maybe she, might, she might have had some stories about her yeah. childhood in India. Or, whatever, or some yeah. memory of the writing style yeah. or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Good. You know, the Atty Flynn House in Springford, um, the people living there now would it would be a rare thing, but if a Westport and a West Top enthusiast mm. came around, mm. what's their Yeah, a West Top enthusiasts have been around. <laughs> um, um, the uh, the one I knew best was a uh, um, Colonel Michael Westrop. He was a retired British Army guy, a lovely man. And um, he got very upset in St. Mary's Cathedral in Limerick. There's a West Drop Chapel in St. Mary's Cathedral, and uh, which was paid for by kind of another branch of the West Drops. And, and um, there was a, a brass plaque under the window saying it had been do donated and whatever. And the previous dean had removed it and was thrown on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I remember Michael West Drop kind of pleading to have it put back up and that he would pay for it and whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was never done. He was kind of very uh, upset, upset mm -hmm. by that. Um, if you're interested in the wider West Drops, um, that there is an actual book that um, won't, uh, a descent, um, again, he wouldn't be any kind of close relative of our West Drops, but he'd be the same kind of family. Um, he wrote a kind of an account of of the different branches of the family, because a lot of them actually went to Australia and New Zealand, and someone went to Canada eventually, and he's kind kind of um, um, tracing the different uh, branches of the family. Um, and um, about eight years ago, I suppose, they actually had a reunion in them. And um, again, the people in Etty Flynn, um, um, some of you might know their products. The people who bought it more recently, it, it sold a couple of times, but the people who bought it more recently are the O'Connells. And they are they have planted um, fruit trees and orchards and things. And there, there's actually Etty Flynn uh, apple juice. Yeah, being a bit now, yeah. And, and they have restored the house. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, the people in Springford are farming and again mm. um, I mean I've taken our own society in there and they're yeah. quite welcoming and whatever yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's mm. a plaque on 77 Lower Lisa Street as well which would be nice 115 Sandy Mount Road if you're in the motor yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you live in Monkstone at, at one stage separate from Sandy Mount mm -hmm. did you live in Monkstone he lived in Monkstone with the mother yeah. Yeah. before yeah. she died so when he goes to Trinity in 1879, he's in Monkstown till uh, 1891 when she dies. And then I presume he's not able to look after himself or whatever. He moves into Leeson Street and whatever. But um, they don't seem to have owned those houses. They seem to, mm. you know, that, that, that when she went to Dublin, that she rented the house mm. in Monkstown, you know, rather, rather than that, that she Maybe a young man, not be only in his 30s. That's all about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But why were you so fascinated with Birth of the Heart then? What got you? Into I was it? just in, intrigued. Um, yeah. um, um, you know, um, I, how a relatively young woman had this big, biggish house, yeah. in, and and uh, um, she seems to have been, you know, um, fairly well off. You know, how did she go from Killarney to Dublin yeah. and? Uh, how did she have mm -hmm. these lodgers yeah. and how did she seduce the young fellow yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he had years to go as a doctor or whatever. Or mm -hmm. did, did he seduce her? Was she yeah. able to support him or finance him yeah, or whatever? Yeah. I don't know. So uh, <laughs> I wasn't obsessed with him, yeah, but, but it's just I was trying to follow yeah, her up yeah. when, when this unexpected yeah. bonus came out. Yeah. She has a good name. It does. It mm. does yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 
the the Alice and Gwendolyn cave. Mm. You know about the Alice and Gwendolyn cave? That's that's uh, in a Westcott related house outside Ennis, isn't it? Yeah, Edenville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they, they were the daughters. Uh, they, they were his nieces. Yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. They were, they were the okay. daughters of his, of his sister. I think he, in some sense, excavated that cave because I think it was through yeah, Thomas Westcott that the bones that were found ended with all up. These animal bones. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which extended human settlement in Ireland about 1500 years or something like that. It was a remarkable yeah, story, yeah. a long time after his yeah, departure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off, I, I, I wish they'd find a bit more evidence. All you have is one bone from that cave yes. with a bit of a straw. <laughs> it would be, be nice to think there was more proof, but it's, anyway, it's, but yeah, it's very enough, exciting yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Gwendolyn Stackpool, um, she went to live in Dublin eventually, and she was very interested all, throughout her life in, in, in you know, he obviously influenced, influenced her um, um, in, in her kind of interests as well, you know. Um, so, yeah, a fascinating family. Well, I suppose we'll wrap up. You mm -hmm. never lost it being dynamic and engaging.